Hallelujah. Can we take this time to greet our neighbors, those who are on the left and right, who are in front of you and back of you, saying, I missed you. I'm happy to see you here. Let's bless each other in the name of the Lord. I missed you. I love you. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us uh, online. And also everybody who's here in the sanctuary worshiping our Lord, our God. And as the uh, lyrics uh, were telling us, uh, we are believing in that time where we will go to heaven and all the tears will be wiped away. There will be no more pain and sorrow and everything will be made new. And we believe and we are hoping for that new Jerusalem. I pray that as we are putting our faith in Jesus Christ and hoping for that new day, May we be able to be victorious every day. And I pray and bless this upon you in the name of the Lord. Amen. 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 Now through today's main passage, Exodus chapter 28, verse 1 and 2, I want to share the message, the redemptive meaning of the breast piece of judgment. The breast piece of judgment. Now, uh, clothing is a very important theme in the Bible, and especially through the garments of the high priest, uh, we can hear about the story of our redemption. Through the clothes and garments of the high priest, we are able to see how God is working through the altar and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so, especially... Amongst the garments of the high priest, we're going to focus on the breast piece of judgment. The breast piece of judgment. If we can get the PowerPoint. And so, if we go back to the Garden of Eden, the place before the fall of Adam and the woman, the Garden of Eden was like the temple where God dwelled with the man and the woman. God's glory filled the Garden of Eden, and it clothed Adam and the woman. So they were naked, and they were not ashamed. So if you look at Psalms 36, verse 8, it says, They drink their fill of the abundance of your house, and you give them to drink of the river of your delights. And so this delights is referring to Eden. The Hebrew word for delights is Eden. And Eden means delight and gladness, thanksgiving and sounds of melody. So the Garden of Eden was like a temple where God dwelt with the man and the woman. Genesis chapter 3.8 says, They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. And so here we see that God's presence was amongst the man and the woman. And God clothed them with his glory. If you look at Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13 and 14, this is also an allusion to the Garden of Eden before the fall. And of course, this is talking about the anointed cherub before he fell. But it's relating to the precious stones that were in the Garden of Eden and that were covering the cherub. So let's read Ezekiel 28, verse 13 and 14. You were in Eden. This is talking about the anointed cherub. The garden of your God is talking about Eden. Every precious stone was your covering. And so in the Garden of Eden, these precious stones were the covering of the anointed cherub. And this word covering is mesuka in Hebrew. And it is derived from suka, meaning booths or tents. So these precious stones was like a tent. And it was like a, a tabernacle that covered the anointed cherub. And so this Precious stones, the ruby, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, and the turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold. 
and you were on the holy mountain of God. So let's think about this imagery of being covered with these precious stones, being covered with God's glory and His light. Let's think about that. Psalms 8, chapter 4, verse 5, and this is uh, important background information and knowledge that we need to have to cover the garments of the high priest, especially the breast piece of judgment. Psalms 8, verse 4 and 5. Now, you can see it on the screen. Why don't we read it together? Ready, begin. What is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. So this word crown in Hebrew is atar, atar. And it means to surround, and it means to bestow. So just like a crown, it's on the head of a person, it surrounds, right? So it has the meaning of surrounding and bestowing, or it means to crown. And so what this is saying is that God surrounded Adam and the woman with glory and majesty, God's glory and majesty. These were the clothes that they were covered with. And so they were naked and they were not ashamed. God covered them. They were surrounded by God's presence. They were surrounded and clothed with God's glory and majesty and beauty. In fact, because Adam was made in the image of God, if you looked at Adam, you could almost see God himself in Adam. We sang the song on that day, you know, uh, believe, right? We will see Christ in each and every one of us fully. We will be fully in God's glory. But here on this earth, we too need to reflect the glory of Christ. We need to glorify God in all of our lives of faith. And so this is a very important fact that we need to understand about the Garden of Eden. Uh, however, there was this fall in the Garden of Eden. There was disobedience. And so they lost the glory of God. So although they were surrounded and clothed and bestowed with glory, they lost it, and they exchanged the glory of God for the glory of beasts and animals. Can you believe that? Romans chapter 1, verse 23. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So, in essence... They became like a beast. A beast in the Bible are those without understanding. So they lost the glory of God, the image of God. Let me change the color here. So they became like four, four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Okay, that should be better. So, they lost the image of God. God's glory had left them. And so, there is the work of restoration through sacrifice. And this is all pointing to uh, the atonement work of Jesus Christ. So, work of restoration through the high priest. And so, here you get a picture of the high priest in the Old Testament. And especially this uh, piece right here is the breast piece of judgment. And this is what we're going to focus on today. And everything that I'm talking about is in the sixth book of the History of Redemption series. So uh, I cannot cover everything in our you know, limited time, but if you read uh, the sixth book, this content will be in there. So this uh, garment that the high priest uh, wore it represented God's splendor and majesty and glory. So man is imperfect. You and I have sin and we have faults and we are inadequate. 
but he used the high priest and priests in the Old Testament and gave them this covering, this garment, in order to reflect the beauty and majesty and holiness of God. And so this, this garment of the high priest was very majestic and beautiful. And especially, out of the garments, probably the breastplate of judgment was uh, very shiny and glorious. And people's eyes would go towards maybe the crown and also the breast piece of judgment. So the garments represented the glory and majesty and beauty and holiness of our Father. So when they looked at the high priest, they did not look at the man, but they looked at God, the Father, who the garments were representing. So this is uh, the role of the garments. And the senior pastor, uh, founder of this church, Dr. Reverend Abraham Park, says that the ministry of the high priest shows and reveals Jesus, who is the eternal high priest. He is the true eternal high priest. So Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1 talks about that, and Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 talks about that. Since then, we have a, a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. So the high priest and the priest in the Old Testament is a shadow of Jesus, the eternal high priest, who comes in the order of Melchizedek. So here we see, and we're going to focus on uh, the breast piece of judgment. So first of all, let's look at the characteristics of the breast piece of judgment. Let's look at the characteristics. So first of all, as we focus in on the breast piece, let's look at its shape and size. So as you can see, it's a square. It's a perfect square. And it's a one span, which is 22.5 centimeters. So you can see uh, the size of it, and it's doubly folded. So you can see partially here that it's folded, it's double folded. So this is the shape and the size. So it's a square. And that's very, square is very important because uh, that is the shape of the Ezekiel's temple. And it represents God's justice and his holiness and his uprightness. The materials. It's made out of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. So this was very uh, expensive material and very bright colors. And this is all reflecting God's beauty and God's majesty and his holiness. So gold, blue, purple, and scarlet material, and fine, fine twisted linen, which is uh, the white material. And on the outer layer, it's, it's like a pocket, okay? And it's strapped to the shoulders, and it's strapped to the ephod belt, and so it, it does not move. It's set in place, and it's locked onto the shoulders there. And if you look at the outer layer, it has 12 stones, as, as you can see in the picture there. And it's set in a gold filigree. So it has a gold setting there where it's engraved and it's placed, mounted on the uh, outer layer there. And as you can see, there's four rows of three stones. And the names of each tribe are engraved on each stone. And... Um, Last week, we were talking about it with, uh, with Deacon and the president. Uh, you know the uh, stone for the tribe of Simeon? It is sapphire. Pastor uh, Jabez talked about that, right? And, and our president and, and our deacon, uh, we were talking about that. And the sapphire is the stone of the tribe of Simeon. And from the tribe of Simeon, the scribes came out, the scribes. So the sapphire, you know, we talked about the saper. It's talked about uh, engraving and writing and recording and counting. And it happens that in God's uh, profound and his amazing uh, 
mystery and his providence that the tribe of Simeon was the tribe that became the scribes who wrote down history and wrote down the law of God. And so this is an amazing uh, administration of, of God's redemptive history. So each name of the tribe are engraved. It's engraved into the stones. And in the inner layer, or if you look at it, it's like a pocket, there is the Urim and Tumim, which is used for judging. And we're going to talk about this as well. So the Urim and Tumim. And there's many speculations of how it looked like, uh, but uh, the Bible does not give real specific uh, description of how the Urim and Tumim worked or how it looked like. And so here, these are the characteristics of the breast piece of judgment. And this was on the breast. It was in the chest area. And this has a lot of meaning in terms of redemptive history and in terms of the atonement work of Jesus Christ. So second, let's look at the Urim and Tumim. So the high priest used the Urim and Tumim to judge and to make decisions. And uh, this was very important because uh, he represented God and God gave him answers through the Urim and Tumim. Exodus 28, verse 30 says, You shall put the, in the breast piece of judgment the Urim and Tumim. Tumim. Urim and Tumim. So they're both plurals, right? Pro, plural form. And they shall be over Aaron's heart. So the chest area here. When he goes in before the Lord, and Aaron shall carry the judgment of the sons of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. So this is an e eternal uh, institution. And so we're going to talk about what it means to carry and why it's important that we know that the breast piece of judgment is over the heart. And we'll talk about those incidents. So Urim, it means lights. So uh, you may know the uh, Hebrew word for light is or and Urim is the plural derivative of or, and it means lights. Tumim. So tumim, it means perfection. Uh, and so uh, it means uh, completion. Tumim. Urim and tumim means lights and perfection. Completeness. So what does this tell us? This tells us that God's judgment is upright and has no partiality. So God is always right. His judgment is always accurate, and there is no error. He is precise. And if you look at the seventh book, uh, the ten words you know, for the uh, commandments, you can look at the word, uh, the judgment in Shabbat. And it shows that God is the ultimate judge. God will judge, right? But the thing is, he judges without partiality. But all of his judgments are based on the foundation of love. So as the breast piece of judgment is covering the chest, God's judgment is fair and it's founded on his agape love. So for people, when we judge each other or when we make um, some kind of criticism or we make a remark, sometimes it's not based on love. Sometimes it's based on revenge or bitterness. We want to get back at that person. And so we judge and we say hurtful things. And those words might be true. It may be factual. Quote, quote. Okay? And it may be Nothing wrong with the actual words. But the problem is the heart in which that message is being proclaimed. And God sees our heart. Even though it's the right message or even though it's true. Even though they are facts. But it's the manner and the heart that we are proclaiming that message and those words. So uh, if you have children... 
or if you have disciples or people under you, you know, when you, you know, rebuke them and you, you know, scold them, they can feel if you are scolding them and if you are rebuking them in love. Uh, this person is saying that because he or she loves me and he cares for me. But sometimes when you get rebuked or you get scolded, you don't feel the, the love behind those words. But in God's judgment and in God's, uh, in God's uh, ways, it is based on love and it is all fair. And so everything that we are going through now, so we have been given gifts and talents and we have been given different tasks. And we cannot say God is unfair. You know, some people, you know, may be tall and, you know, they, they may have, you know, a lot of money, but, you know, God is fair. May, maybe their face is not so, you know, handsome or pretty, you know. God is fair, right? You cannot have everything, right? Or maybe, you know, they have good faith, but, you know, they might be a little bit short, or, you know, they might not have a lot of money. But God is fair. And according to his judgment, he has put us into each situation that we are in. God, that's not fair. Why is that person, you know, in that position? Or why am I just here? And you look at other people. But God is accurate and his judgment is always fair. Man shows partiality. Romans 3, 4 says that every man is found to be a liar and only God is true. You might think, you know, I live righteously, I live, you know, with integrity and I don't commit the big sins. And you might think you are righteous, but in the Bible it says no one is righteous. No one is righteous before God. We are all sinners before God and everybody is found a liar. You might think that you are saying the truth or you are being impartial, but God is saying that every man is a liar and unrighteous. And so a lot of people who, who live a good life, uh, they're uh, very uh, rigid and they tend to judge others because you know, they have not committed those big sins. And righteousness is judged on their own standard. They judge people from their own righteousness and their own ethical behavior. But if we judge ourselves before God, everybody is found to be exposed and to be a liar and a sinner and dirty and an adulterer. God exposes all of that in everybody. Proverbs chapter, one, chapter 11 verse 1 it says, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord but a just weight is his delight. Proverbs 20, 23 says, different weights are an abomination to the Lord and a false scale is not good. And so, there, think about ourselves. There are people that we like and there are people that we don't like. And just that fact alone shows us that we are already uh, partial, that we discriminate. There are people that we like, there are people we don't like. But Christ, our eternal high priest, he embraces all and has put us into his heart and engraved us into his heart. He does not show partiality, but he all loves us. He loves us all. James 4, 11, 12 says, Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a, a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and one judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you? But who are you who judge your neighbor? So God is the judge. And it is our job to pray for each other. It is our ministry as priests to pray and lift up each other. And somebody may be in sin, and somebody may be uh, transgressing before the Lord, but we need to still pray for those people and hope that they will repent and they will come back. 
God doesn't want to see anybody fall and anybody to come into judgment or disgrace. God wants everybody to be saved and to do well. And when his children, they fall into judgment, that is hurting to the heart of God. That's not something that God is pleased to do. 1 Samuel 16, 7, it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance. So they were looking for a new king because God rejected Saul. Do not look at the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance. So man judges only what they see. They don't know what's going on inside. But the Lord looks at the heart. So, you know, we were talking about marriage yesterday with the presidential board and with the evangelist Joanna. And when we are single and getting married, most of the people want to look at the appearance, how tall they are and how beautiful they are and how handsome they are, how much money they make and all of those things, what kind of car they have, where do they live. But God wants us to look at that person's faith first. That is the most important thing, is to look at the person's faith. Do they believe in Jesus? Do they have the same type of faith and philosophy? God is the only one who judges the inward heart. He looks at us. And so Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, The word of God is active and alive and sharper than a double-edged sword. And it is dividing to the soul and spirit and to the joints and marrows. And it judges every intention of the heart. So intention. God judges our faith. We cannot see that. We cannot look at a person and say, oh, they believe well and, or they don't believe well. That person has faith or that person doesn't have faith. We tend to make that judgment. But only God sees that. God sees that faith. God sees the intention. God sees what's inside the heart of man. Deep inside of the heart of man. And so this is uh, something that we need to take to heart. What is the Urim and Tumim of today? How do we need to make decisions? And first of all, it is the Word of God. And Psalms 119, 105 says, The Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So, the word itself is light. And when we make decisions or when we um, are deciding on what to do and looking for answers, the answer must come from the word of God, first of all. That is the first place where the answer comes. That is confirmation. So confirmation comes from the word of God. You might, you might think, you might think, oh, I feel this is the right answer. But that has to be confirmed with the Word of God. The Word of God has to be ultimate authority. Does it line up with the Word of God? Is the Word of God confirming what is going on? And next, it is prayer. So prayer. And Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And the important thing is, and do not lean on your own understanding, your own understanding, your own experience, your own knowledge, and your own feelings, your own thoughts. Do not trust that, but trust everything to God. And it says, in all your ways, acknowledge Him. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And He will... Make your path straight. So in every situation or decision or in every action that we are doing, we need to acknowledge God. God, we need to ask, God, what do you want me to do? Where should I go? Should I meet that person? Should I not meet that person? And these are all done through prayer. And we get answers through the word. So John chapter 15 verse 7 it says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done for you. So we pray according to the word. We pray with the word. 
holding on to the covenant of God, the promises of God. And God will direct us. James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, we need to pray for wisdom. If anyone lacks wisdom, pray for it. If you lack wisdom, ask God, and He will give you the wisdom. And just like Solomon and Daniel, they had the wisdom of God. Daniel had the ten times the wisdom and understanding and discernment, and God raised him above all of the leaders and all of the nations. Solomon ruled the nation through his wisdom. James 3, 17, 18 says, But the wisdom from above is first pure. So there is earthly wisdom, which is demonic. So there's actually demonic wisdom. It's trickery. It's deception. And there's selfish ambition and greed all behind that demonic and earthly wisdom. But the wisdom that is from above, heavenly wisdom, is first of all pure. There's nothing uh, uh, corrupt about it. It's peaceable, gentle. So there is patience there, and there is waiting upon God. It's reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So, the wisdom of God will result in peace and reconciliation. It will result in oneness. But the wisdom that is earthly and demonic will always divide and always cause quarrels because people's ambitions and their schedules and agendas are more important than seeking God's will. So we need to bear this fruit of righteousness and this fruit of peace in our lives. James 4, verses 1 and 4 says, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source, is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. So God is looking at our motives. Why are we praying for that? Why are we asking for that? Our intention. So we need to ask for the wisdom of God so that we can discern good and evil. We can discern what is right and what is wrong. And ultimately, the Urim and Tumim that the high priest uses for judgment is talking about the final judgment that will come at the second coming. Final judgment. Revelation 20, 12 through 13 says that they were judged from the books. They were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. So on the day of judgment, God will look at all of our deeds and uh, all of our actions. And God will judge accordingly. And so I pray that may we be able to settle accounts with God every day. Every day needs to be like your last day. Every sermon, every act needs to be like as if it is your last day before God. Settle accounts before God. Repent and be right with God today. Every day as if it is the last day. And I pray and bless this upon you in the name of the Lord. Amen. And last, and we'll quickly go over this, last is the 12 precious stones. And uh, this is kind of a long message, but and I was struggling to decide whether to do it all in pieces or all you know, in one message. But we'll quickly go over the third point. So 12 precious stones. And the 12 stones represent the 12 tribes of Israel as we talked about. And so here you can see uh, that there were the precious stones and they were in order. Judah was uh, represented by the ruby. So Topaz was Issachar, Emerald, Sebulun, Reuben was Turquoise, Simeon was Sapphire, and God was the diamond, and Ephraim was the Jacinth, and Manasseh was the, the Jagate, and the Benjamin was the Amethyst. 
and Dan is the beryl, Asher is the onyx, and Naphtali is the jasper. And this is all in uh, the order of the uh, camp of the Israelites in the Old Testament. And so Exodus 28 verse 21, it talks about the stones representing the tribes, and they are in the order of camps. So here, Judah and Issachar and Zebulun are the tribes that were on the east side, and they led the, the march. So they were first, and they rolled out in that order. And then Reuben, Simeon, God, Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin, Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. And so it is in the order of the camps uh, as they were in the wilderness. And the 12 tribes are mentioned in Revelation, which is the 144,000. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, and Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 and 3. And these are the 144,000 who washed their robes and made them white. And they are on Mount Zion, standing with the Lamb and singing the new song. So it's uh, 12,000 times 12. So 12,000 times 12, 144,000. This is symbolic number, symbolic number. And each of the precious stones have their own position and color. And that tells us that God has placed us in a particular position and he has given us a particular task. And so, for instance, we have the president or we have the choir director. They are a specific task in a place. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 4, there are a variety of gifts but the same spirit. So we have different gifts. You know, I wish I could be in the choir and sing well, but I cannot sing well and I don't have a good voice. And, you know, that's, it's, God has called me to, you know, be on the pulpit. Matthew 25, verse 14 and 15, it talks about how God has given us different talents. He's given us five talents, two talents, and one talent. But everybody has been given one talent at least. And you need to use it for God. You cannot bury it and be lazy and wicked servant. And we're going to go into our general assemblies and everybody who's part of Shiloh or if you consider yourself a true member needs to volunteer in some way and serve here at Shiloh. Even if it's just one thing, one talent. Do not bury it. And God is not looking at how much we do. Oh, because this person received five talents and, you know, God is looking at that person as greater. God is looking at our hearts and He's looking at us and seeing if, are we doing according to what God has given to us? That is important. So it's not a matter of number, five, two, or one. It doesn't matter. But just as God gave to us, are we using that talent for God? So for instance, for, ex for example, let's say I was given five talents and I'm only using three talents and I'm not using the other two talents. And the one person who received the one talent is just using the one. They're putting all of their efforts and they're, you know, using their one talent, you know, 100%. And when people judge that, they say, oh, the person who received five talents is doing much more work than the person who has just that one talent. And they judge on the outward appearance. But how do you think God will judge? God will look at that person who received the five talents and said, I gave you five. Why are you not using the five? And he will not be pleased. But he will look at the person who has one talent and he's, or she is using that one talent, and God will be pleased because he's doing the best, and he's doing with what God has given to him. And so this is very important. If we are part of Shiloh, we need to be part of serving this department and serving the nations. We have different spots and different tasks, but we are going towards that one same mission Song of Solomon, A6 says, Put me like a seal over your heart. 
So the stone shall be set according to the names of the sons of Israel. And it says, they shall be like engravings of a seal. Hotam is the word seal, right? Hotam. Engraved. And so Solomon Solomon says, put me like a seal over your heart. So we are like sealed in the heart of God. So let's look, look at the redemptive historical significance of the breast piece of judgments and make a conclusion. Jesus Christ is our eternal high priest and he cares for us and he protects us with his fervent love. Matthew 23 verse 37, John chapter 13 verse 23. So the chest and the breast area of of the high priest representing God's fervent love, zealous love for his people. Also, Jesus carried our sins and diseases and took away the reproach on the cross. And so it says that Aaron shall carry the judgment of the sons of Israel over his heart before the Lord. And that carry is nasa. It means to carry or to take on the burden. It means to lift up. And so this carry is a word, nasa, and it has a lot of Uh, meaning in terms of redemptive history. And God carried the Israelites when he took them into the wilderness. So the same word, God carried you just as a man carries his son. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 and 5. Surely our griefs he himself bore. That same word, Nasa. Jesus bore and carried upon our sins and grief, and he lifted us up to the right hand of God the Father. The kingdom of God is Abraham's bosom, right? So the chest is representing the kingdom of God. And so the breast piece of judgment is like a microcosm of the new Jerusalem. So the bride of Christ is the new Jerusalem, adorned for her husband. Revelation chapter 21, verse 2 and 3. So this new Jerusalem is the bride of Christ coming down from heaven, adorned. But how is it adorned? With precious stones. Revelations 21 verse 19 to 20 says that they were adorned with every kind of precious stone. So now we're going back to the Garden of Eden. And this is the recovery of the Garden of Eden. Where the bride and the church are being covered and adorned with these precious stones. And we are reflecting the glory of God again. God will be our glory. And what are the... Precious stones of the bride. And according to 1 Peter 3, 1 through 5, it is the image of Christ, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Your adornment must not be external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy woman... Also, who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. But this is not just talking about physical couple. This is talking about the bride and Christ, and how the bride needs to reflect the glory of Christ through the image of God. And also, the precious stones are the faith and works refined by fire. But he knows the way I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Or pure gold, right? 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 14 says, Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will reveal it, because it will be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. And if man's work which he has built on it remains, he shall receive a reward. So, that precious, those precious stones, our faith, are our uh, works, and it's all going to be different. So just as the sun and the moon and the stars have different glory, we will all have different brightness and glory in the kingdom of God. And so according to how much good deeds you do, and uh, how much faith and how well you walked with God, your glory and your Your brightness will be different in the kingdom of God. The glory will be different. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 40 and 
42 talks about that. As we think about this, and we think about our lives of faith, uh, this is very important because this will be our covering, God's light and His glory. Those precious stones will be our covering. And what are we doing to adorn ourselves and preparing ourselves to meet Jesus Christ, who is our true husband? What are we doing to prepare for His coming? And through the breast piece of judgment, we can understand that the judgment day will come soon. And we need to live as if we are in the end time, in the last days. May you walk with God like Enoch. As you are looking towards the end time, that last day of judgment. And may you walk with him moment by moment, as we sang in the praise. And as you do, may you please God with your faith and your works. And I pray and bless this upon you in the name of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much for this blessed and holy Lord's Day. And you are teaching us about the breast piece of judgment. And Father, may we be engra engraved in your heart and sealed. And Father, may we be able to reflect your glory. May we be able to walk with you every day looking forward to that final day as we will be transfigured into new spiritual bodies. Help us to be like the true bride who is adorned for her husband, being awake and having our lamps burning and shining brightly. We thank you so much. And in all these things we pray, in Jesus' precious name with thanksgiving, amen. Let's give glory to God.